Good evening and welcome to our service of festal choral evensong from the Tunstall Chapel at University College in Durham. Tonight is a special service. It is the last Thursday of the term, of Epiphany term. Uh, our services will resume on the week of the 26th of April. And tonight following the service, we have our college feast. Of course, it is an online college feast given the circumstances uh, related to the pandemic, but um, we hope that it will be a very joyful uh, moment to spend together, albeit in different parts um, of the country, of the city, of the world. Um, tonight's service features special pieces of music. We have an introit, we have hymns, we have um, special organ music uh, played by our junior choral scholar um, Edmund Milwain. And we also have um, a former senior organ scholar, Imogen Morgan, who has um, written Precess and Responses, which you will hear tonight. Uh, so really the service brings together the past and present community. And we hope that in spite of the fact that we would wish to have our community here present in chapel, that it brings uh, light, hope, joy, wherever you may be at this time. And please do join us uh, for the uh, college feast afterwards. Again, a very warm welcome. Our opening hymn is hymn number 235, Both in thy name, O Lord, I go. Hymn 235.
tonight is Psalm 93. Psalm 93. from the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Baalim, and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I had laid meat unto them. He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refused to return. And the sword shall abide on his cities, and shall consume his branches, and devour them, because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Ziboim? My heart is turned within me, my repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger, I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Here ended the reading.
The second reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 to the end. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood him not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and man. Here endeth the reading.
believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The anthem this evening is Crucifixus from a mass Musa Assunta as Maria by Giovanni Perluigi da Balestrino. The words Crucifixus et Antonovis, Sulpuntio Pilato Passus et Sepultus est, et Resurrex Tertias Vier, Secondum Scripturas, et Ascendis in Cielo, Seven et Dexter Antatis. Et interum venturus est cum gloria judicare divos et ut mortuos, cuius regnum non est finis, can be translated as He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In nowadays Jerusalem, behind Al-Aqsa Mosque, excavations over the years have unearthed spectacular stairs near mikvehs, a mikvah being a bath for ritual purification. We know that Jewish people on pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem, as it is the case here for Passover in our gospel passage from Luke, would have purified themselves in those baths before making their offering at the temple. Women were not allowed to walk up these stairs leading to the temple, men only were. And nobody apart from the high priests, whose primary function was to do the sacrifices in the temple, could enter the temple itself. The arches on the top of these stairs, through which men would have walked to make their offering, have been filled with the typical limestone you find all over in Jerusalem. They are blocked, but once they were open, and once, twice, several times, in fact, Jesus, as a Jewish young boy and man, walked through these. 
I sat on those stairs several times, wondering where exactly Jesus had been. Not that it really mattered to walk exactly in the steps of Jesus, but there is something about having one's body, being close to the space where God incarnate, God made flesh, God taking on human form, human body walked on this earth. Upon reading the passage from Luke, what I am most wondering about is the questions Jesus asked that day when he was sitting with the teachers. It is interesting to me that he is listening and asking questions, yet what amazes people are his answers and his wisdom. Later on, when he discusses with his parents, again he asks questions. He does not give answers, although you may, you may agree with me that the last one is a rhetorical question. I very much like that Jesus was asking questions, that God incarnate was not offering necessarily all the answers, but was asking questions. We have very few examples of Jesus as a child, and even fewer as a teenager or young adult. Following his birth, we know nothing until this episode at the temple. And following this chapter, Luke jumps to Jesus' baptism and the beginning of his ministry when he's around 30 years old. Yet, while learning is a lifelong process, these years of childhood, teenagehood and young adulthood are critical years of learning and formation. What questions was Jesus asking to the teachers? We also hear that he was giving answers and proved to be already of great wisdom. Was he already asking rhetorical questions? Was he challenging the teachers on some of their interpretations? Was he already proving that he would be himself a great rabbi, a great teacher himself, not so much for the answers he was giving, but rather because he knew that ways of exploring the text in the Jewish tradition, the sacred text, was by asking questions. Later on in his ministry, we know that Jesus will continue to ask questions, often, yet not always, rhetorical ones. And when you ask questions, you prompt the others to find the answers themselves. In a university, questions are our daily bread. Why is it that things are the way they are? Where do they come from? Why this shape and this color? Why do certain people react more severely to a virus than others? How did this event take place? What was its impact on future generations? When did the first occurrence of this word appear? What is the story of that painting? As the poet Paul Valéry wrote, the surprise is not that things are, but that they are in a particular way. Yet we know that there is a lot that goes in questions. Habits, blind spots, what we can easily take for the way things are, forgetting that they were shaped like this through conscious or unconscious decisions. A colleague of mine Peggy Law recently put in contrast the unchanging interpretations with the unchangeable truth of God. As answers to our questions, do we face unchanging interpretations, unchanging interpretations that have been said for us, accepted by many, which have become unquestionable norms, or do they reflect the unchangeable truth? Of God. 
When I read in our Gospel passage for tonight that Jesus was gone missing, I could not but think of the news we heard more than a week ago now, that a young woman named Sarah Everard was gone missing. Of course, when this makes the news on the BBC, a real concern emerges, along with questions, many questions. As it happened, we had just celebrated International Women's Day and the question of the safety of women in our society was asked. Once again, very young, as young as children, girls, and I want to say in some ways in a paradoxical way, girls who are fortunate enough to be protected, learn that the safety of their body will be a regular or constant challenge. It may vary depending on where they live, but they learn very early that am I safe in this situation will be at the back of their mind on a regular basis. On Monday evening, students, women, men, non-binary people gathered on Palace Green, all physically distant, wearing masks, holding flowers and candles, entirely silent, intently listening to testimonies of survivors. Survivors of abuse, of sexual violence, women who faced the unchanging interpretations that it was their fault, that it was the way they dressed, that what happened would not have happened if they had done this or that. In short, to the question, why did this happen and how can we prevent this from happening to others, the answer was to ask potential future victims to change putting the responsibility on their shoulders rather than on the shoulders of the perpetrators, or worse, on whole societies that accept an interpretation as unchangeable and have silenced survivors for a very long time. Instead, on Monday, cardboards read, reclaim the streets, reclaim the streets, Educate your mates. She just wanted to go home. Would this same uprising have taken place if Sarah had not been a white woman? I read the other day. And I think it is, it is a truly valid question. And perhaps what this question is leading us to think about is what her specific example can help us question and address. What are the blind spots, the unchanging interpretations that we have yet to question? When a woman of color says that she has to raise her boy with the fear of him being more likely arrested just because of the color of his skin, can we listen? When she says that she feels the discrimination, the unspoken, insidious discrimination in her everyday life towards herself, towards her children, can we listen? Discrimination against women is very, very old. Yet, centuries of questions have proved that the unchanging interpretations could be changed and could give birth to a new reality. All sorts of discriminations based on race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, economic background, I mean, you, you name it, have a very, very long history. Until the unspoken rules get spoken about, until the blind spots are in full sight, until the unchanging interpretations are challenged, until the hearts are changed. A university, a college, 
is a place of formation, of never-ending learning and discovery for everyone involved. We are formed, molded, shaped as human beings in the hope to get out of college or out of this workplace better than when we arrived. What are the unchanging interpretations that we have yet to question in our community? And as a Christian, I cannot but ask, do they reflect the unchangeable truth of God? The unchangeable truth that God is love. And if not, how do we make the shift? Amen. Let us pray. On this College of Feast Day, we give thanks for all members of our community who have kept us safe and in good health all the way throughout this pandemic and who continue to do so. We pray for the college housekeeping staff. We pray for the catering staff, for our porters, for everyone responsible for our buildings and grounds, for every member in our teams and for all members of staff who have been coordinating them and whose decisions affect the welfare of everyone. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for all of our students here in Durham and everywhere in the world. We pray especially for those for whom it is particularly challenging and who feel disconnected from the college because they could not return to Durham. We give thanks for student leaders and all the initiatives created to build a sense of community, to help each other in these very trying times, to reach out beyond our walls. And tonight we give thanks especially to our choir, to our music director, to our junior organ scholar, for all their work throughout this term to bring music, beauty, hope, joy to our college community through their dedication to music. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray for our JCR, MCR and SCR. We give thanks for this occasion to gather, at least virtually, to share a moment of celebration and fellowship as we await the day when we will be all able to come back to college together again. We pray for our college office, for our principal Wendy, vice principal Ellen, assistant principal David, for Paula, Linda, Mike, Zoe, Jamie, Dan, for everyone involved in the leadership of our college and for a brighter future beyond this pandemic. We offer our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In a moment of quietness, we offer to God our own words of gratitude, our petitions and intercessions for people we hold in our hearts, the situations which require our prayers, and we remember those, especially from our community, who have died. Pray for healing for Wendy Mills and for Michael Mills and their family. We pray for the repose of the soul of John Morrison, Lynn Everson. Pray that they may rest in peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We conclude our prayers with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 86, My Soul is Love and Known. Hymn 86. <laughs>